I think it's fair to say that most of us go through a process of transformation in our lives where we end up in a place we never expected to be. We can surprise ourselves with where we end up in later life. This program's about a man who ended up being the most important English composer of his time. Famous for writing religiously inspired works for a popular market. But he started out life as a German, trained in church music and longing for a career in opera. It's a life journey unparalleled in the history of music. The man's name is George Friedrich Handel. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say his name became George Friedrich Handel. He was born Georg Friedrich Handel in the town of Halle in what is now Eastern Germany. The year of his birth, 1685, is significant too because it saw the births of two other remarkable composers, Johann Sebastian Bach and Domenico Scarlatti. Each went on to have dynamic careers in completely different fields. Bach, from a family of hard-working musicians, became hugely famous as an organist and left us some of the greatest Protestant church music ever written. Scarlatti, son of a great opera composer, was one of the leading keyboard virtuosi of his day writing no less than 555 dazzling sonatas for harpsichord. Handel's origins were similar to Bach's. Haller was in the heartland of Protestant Germany, and his family was working class. But unlike Bach, who came from the greatest musical dynasty the world has ever seen, Handel's family engaged in less artistic concerns. In fact, there were no other musicians in his family at all. Do you know what is truly extraordinary? That he and Johann Sebastian Bach were born a very short distance apart from each other in Germany in the same year, and they never met. Can you imagine if they had? Imagine being a fly on the wall at that meeting. The region has always been associated with the harvesting of salt, even as far back as the Bronze Age. The city itself originated in the early 9th century, and in the 13th century, it became part of the powerful Hanseatic League, a loose coalition of towns and cities in northern Europe designed to facilitate trade and defense. And Halle certainly profited from it. Like most of Europe, though, it was devastated by the Thirty Years' War, which lasted from 1618 to 1648 finally coming to an end about 40 years before Handel was born. After the war, the city was placed under the administration of the Duke of Saxony. He brought musicians to Halle from Dresden, meaning that by the time Handel was a boy, the city's musical life was well-established and highly professional. The composer's father, also called Georg, had no interest in music, though. He was a barber surgeon in the service of the Duke, a post which enabled him, though a commoner, to move in exalted circles with ease, a trait clearly inherited by his son, as we shall see. The profession of barber-surgeon had a long and proud history, albeit one we might find distasteful. In the days before modern medical understanding, let alone anaesthetics, having access to sharp instruments meant that a barber-surgeon could perform minor surgical procedures, bloodletting and tooth extractions, as well as cutting hair. Hendel Sr. must have been particularly good at this sort of work, to have been in the service of a duke, but there's no indication that his only son had any intention of following in his father's footsteps. Handel's father was 63 when his son was born. The composer's mother, Dorothea Taust, was Georg Handel's second wife. The daughter of a Lutheran pastor, she was 34 at the time of the composer's birth. The Handel House in Halle preserves the building in which he was born and is now a museum dedicated to the composer and the music of his time. A modern extension to the building contains a hugely important collection of some 750 musical instruments with interactive activities for visitors. In addition to historical displays and research facilities, the Handel House in Halle also contains a small concert hall and a workshop dedicated to the restoration of historical musical instruments. <laughs> 
1859, as the result of an international fundraising effort, the centenary of Handel's death was celebrated by erecting an imposing bronze statue of the composer, the work of the sculptor Hermann Heidel, in the marketplace in Halle. Concerts in cities such as Leipzig had been held to raise money, and celebrities, the most famous was the Swedish soprano Jenny Lind, donated their services to the cause. Her efforts are acknowledged by her image being included in the pedestal of the finished statue. Handel's birthplace is the focus of the Halle Handel Festival, which began in 1922 and has been held annually every summer since 1952. This is one of the major international events on the Handel calendar, with some of the world's greatest performers invited to perform music not only by Handel, but by his contemporaries. Handel's early interest in music was actively discouraged by his father, who tried to steer his son towards a more respectable career. But the old man's employer, the Duke, happened to overhear the nine-year-old boy playing the organ and overruled his father, directing him to have the boy taught properly by Friedrich Zacco, the organist at the Liebfrauenkirche in Halle, a fine musician who gave the boy excellent lessons in organ, harpsichord, and composition. Introducing him to a vast collection of German and Italian music, sacred and profane, vocal and instrumental compositions of different schools, different styles, and of every master. He must have done his work thoroughly, because he was the only teacher Handel ever had. As it happens, Handel had been baptized the day after he was born in Zacho's church, the Liebfrauenkirche, or Church of Our Dear Lady. Sometimes known as the Marktkirche, or Market Church, it's located right in the center of Halle. The original building dates from the 16th century, and like many churches in the region, it proudly records the fact that Martin Luther once preached there. Though it was heavily bombed shortly before the end of the Second World War, in the late 1940s it was painstakingly restored so that it looks just as it would have done to Handel. Just before he turned 12, Handel's father died, and with him went any opposition to a musical career. But as the only son, he now had to contribute to the family finances. At the age of 17, he began studying law at Halle University, just as his late father would have wished, no doubt, with a view to having a safety net if his musical aspirations came to nothing. But no sooner had he enrolled than he was appointed organist at the Cathedral Church in Halle. For a while, his two paths in life were in competition with each other. The Calvinist Cathedral Church in Halle dates back to the 13th century. Originally part of a Dominican monastery, hence its lack of a steeple, it was rededicated in 1688 to the reformed evangelical faith, an offshoot of Calvinism. Unlike Lutheran churches, reformed churches gave music a minimal role, so Handel had little to do in this post apart from playing hymns. Whether this led to him being bored or Misbehaving, we don't know, but his contract wasn't taken up after the 12 months probation period. By this time, Handel knew that a career in music was what he wanted, and that that career would not be in church music, but in opera. And to do that, he needed to spread his wings. He set his sights on Hamburg. Handel left Halle in the middle of 1703 at the age of 18 and would only ever return as an occasional visitor. 300 kilometers to the northwest, Hamburg had a vibrant musical culture. At its center was a remarkable opera house, the Hamburg Oper an Gänsemarkt, run by a remarkable man, Reinhard Kaiser. Handel found a job there as violinist and harpsichordist in the orchestra. Under Kaiser, 
The opera was run as a purely commercial venture and not under the patronage of a member of the nobility. The operas themselves were rather long to our way of thinking, four hours as a rule, and they were sung in a mixture of Italian and German with a bit of French sometimes thrown in for good measure. The plots freely mixed serious and comic elements. Handel worked his way up the orchestral pecking order, soon directing performances from the harpsichord. He was learning the opera business from the inside. Another rising star working for Kaiser was the tenor and composer Johann Matheson, who was only a few years older than Handel. In his Cleopatra, Matheson wrote the role of Antony for himself to sing. The performances were directed from the harpsichord by Handel, until after Antony's onstage death, after which it was his custom to go into the pit, shoe Handel off his seat at the harpsichord and conduct the last part of the opera himself. At one performance, Handel refused to budge. This led to a duel between the two hot-headed young musicians. In his biography of Handel, one of the most valuable sources of information about the composer's early life, Matheson says that he would have undoubtedly killed Handel had it not been for a button on the latter's coat, which deflected the point of his sword. Both men saw this as a clear sign of divine intervention, resolved their differences, and ended up better friends than ever. Reinhard Kaiser is what one might describe as a colorful character. At one point, his debts were so enormous he had to skip town for a while, leaving the opera house in the hands of his younger colleagues and providing Handel, at the age of just 19, with the chance of composing his first opera. Almira, Queen of Castile, was a hit and ran for 20 performances. There was even a role in it for Johann Matheson. These three years in Hamburg were enormously important to Handel's development, both as a composer and as a businessman. But he felt he needed to learn more, especially about the Italian style of vocal writing and the more formal style of Italian opera called opera seria, serious opera. And that meant a voyage to Italy. It was probably in late 1706 that Handel, completely on his own and with no job to go to, left Hamburg and headed for Italy. If his three years in Hamburg were crucial in his development, then the three and a half years he spent in Italy can be said to have made him a mature and confident composer. While he was in Italy, he undertook work in Rome, Naples, Florence and Venice. He seemed amazingly to have been able to move among the high and mighty with complete ease, confident in his talent and eager to compose at every opportunity. This was a gift he inherited from his father. But the way he learned how to work a room, as we might say today, was all his own. It's even more astonishing that when he reached Rome, this itinerant young German Lutheran musician was readily accepted into the highest echelons of the Catholic Church. A number of cardinals commissioned work from him. He wrote magnificent Latin church music for an important Carmelite festival, and he lived in the magnificent household of Francesco Maria Marescotti, Prince Ruspoli, whose Kapellmeister he became. The one thing he couldn't do was spread his operatic wings because the current pope had banned it. Nonetheless, he benefited from the lavish private concerts thrown by nobles in their palaces, for which he turned out an enormous amount of vocal music, secular cantatas on stories from classical mythology, oratorios on religious subjects, and even extensive serenatas, which were concert operas in all but name. The church music for the Carmelites includes the earliest Handel work regularly performed today, a virtuoso setting of the psalm Dixit Dominus. But opera was still the main game in Handel's mind, and to write one, he had to go elsewhere, Florence. There, his first Italian opera, Rodrigo, was performed in 1707 to great acclaim. He was presented with a hundred sequins and a service of plate. They really liked it. Shortly afterwards, he was back in Rome, writing more lavish vocal music for the Cardinals and Prince Ruspoli, and then on to Naples, where he composed a large-scale Italian serenata on the Aces and Galatea story, a story he would come back to years later in England. It was in Venice, though, 
at the end of 1709 that Handel had his greatest operatic triumph in Italy with Agrippina, which caused a sensation, running for no less than 27 performances. Venetian opera, though in Italian, had much in common with the style of opera Handel had known in Hamburg. Comic and serious elements sat side by side, and there were open references to the political issues of the day. The Handel who wrote Agrippina was light years away from the beginner who, a mere four years earlier, had written Almira in Hamburg. He was now aged 25 and the master of the Italian style. The performances of Agrippina coincided with the carnival period, which in the 18th century went on for some months. Venice during carnival was one of the highlights of the grand tour. And the city was full of hot-blooded yuppies, making the most of the city's attractions, both artistic and otherwise, as well as nobles and diplomats. Like the Venice Film Festival or Biennale nowadays, it offered excellent opportunities for networking. While performing Agrippina during Carnival, Handel, a master networker, made the most of his exposure to an international audience. Representatives of the courts of Queen Anne of Great Britain and the Elector Georg of Hanover were there, and Handel got snapped up as Kapellmeister, court music director, by Hanover. The two courts were connected. Indeed, the Elector's mother, the 81-year-old Dowager Electress Sophia of Hanover, had just become next in line to the British throne under a recent law which forbade Catholics from being crowned. More than 50 places down the line of succession, she was the first Protestant on the list and therefore stood to succeed Queen Anne. Her son, the Elector Georg, would then succeed her. In early 1710, as soon as the run of Agrippina had ended, Handel left Venice. He was appointed to his new post in Hanover in the June, but was immediately granted a year's leave of absence, enabling him to travel to London to explore the possibility of working there as an opera composer. This seems very odd, until we look behind the facade. Yes, Handel did indeed want to explore what London might have to offer him. The British capital was only just starting to embrace Italian opera, but the Elector was keen to find out as much as he could about England before the death of Queen Anne. A steady stream of German diplomats and professionals set off for London during the final years of her reign, sending back intelligence on British politics, the economy, and anything else which might be useful for a future king to know. Handel seems to have done this too, which might explain his presence in London for a year while receiving his full Hanover salary. He arrived in the English capital near the end of 1710, and here again we see how easily he moved in the highest circles and quickly made the right connections. Within a couple of months, he was performing privately for Queen Anne on the occasion of her birthday, and a few weeks later, in February 1711, his first opera for London, Rinaldo, had its premiere. It caused a sensation, staged lavishly with a first-rate cast of Italian singers. It ran for 15 performances in its first season. Songs from it were published during the run, Handel knew all about merchandising, and the opera was revived for another run early the following year. By that time, Handel was back in Hanover, fulfilling some of his nominal duties there. But he was soon back again in London, writing more operas and developing his connections with the royal family. In the three years during which he held the title of Hanover Kapellmeister, he was only actually in Hanover for a little over a year. In mid-1713, he was dismissed. He lived on freelance income for six months before being awarded an annual pension of 200 pounds from the British Crown at the end of the year. A landmark which played a vital role in Handel's early London years was the famous St. Paul's Cathedral. Christopher Wren's massive edifice was only completed a few years before Handel arrived, and it was in here that a national service of thanksgiving was held 
to mark the signing of a peace treaty, the Treaty of Utrecht. It's astonishing that a foreigner, and a recently arrived one at that, should have been asked to compose the two canticles for the service. The Utrecht, Te Deum and Jubilate are among the first works Handel wrote setting English texts. Wisely, he looked to famous earlier settings of these texts by Henry Purcell as his models. Handel imbued these settings not only with theatrical splendor, he was an opera composer after all, but also with architectural splendor. The music matches the massive spaces of the church, with silences included to allow the music to fade away in the reverberant acoustic. In 1714, the Dowager Electress Sophia of Hanover died. Her son, the Elector Georg, duly became heir to the British throne. Shortly after, Queen Anne herself died, ending the Stuart line and ushering in the House of Hanover. Georg came to London and became King George I. Handel was never out of favor with his former employer, who almost immediately granted a continuation of his pension. And before long, he was calling on Handel to help him both to endear himself to his new subjects and to win a public relations war with his son, George, Prince of Wales, later to be George II. The king and his son loathed one another, a phenomenon which seems to have infected every Hanoverian generation. Each set up rival courts, favored different political parties and sought to outdo each other in the public eye. The king used ostentatious display as his main weapon, and from early in the reign held a number of water parties on the Thames at night. These attracted huge crowds on the banks, straining to get a glimpse of the king. And in 1717, they not only saw, but heard. The king employed Handel and 50 musicians to accompany his entourage down the river. And for this event, Handel composed what rapidly became known as his water music. The water music contains more than 20 short pieces and lasts about an hour when played complete. The king ordered the music to be played in its entirety, not once, but twice as they made their way along the river, starting at 8 p.m. from Whitehall to Chelsea. There he had a lavish supper, after which, at 11 p.m., they boarded the barges again for the return journey, during which the king ordered the music to be played a third time. They didn't arrive back at Whitehall until one or two in the morning. Exhausted though Handel and his orchestra were, the music was a palpable hit. It was the first time in England that horns had been used in an orchestra, and extracts from the water music appeared in print in all sorts of arrangements for years. For a composer till then known exclusively for writing vocal music, the purely instrumental water music showed he could meet any commission which came his way. Between Rinaldo and the water music, Handel had been busy composing more operas, but for the year and a half after the famous water party, Handel spent most of his time outside London at Cannons, the estate of the fabulously wealthy and possibly corrupt James Bridges, Earl of Carnarvon in what is now Edgware, a suburb in the northwest of London. Handel was the Earl's house composer at a time when there was little operatic activity taking place in London. Bridges' house no longer survives, but his chapel, St. Lawrence's, does. It was for this beautiful little sanctuary that Handel wrote a series of chamber-sized anthems in English for his patron. Bridges was made first Duke of Shandor shortly after Handel's time there. These magnificent anthems are accordingly known as the Shandos anthems. Two much larger works, also in English, date from Handel's time in canons. One sacred, the other secular. The secular work is Asis and Galatea, 
a pastoral tale based on the same story he'd set to music in Italian in Naples in 1708. We don't know if this delicious piece, scored for just three singers and orchestra, was staged like an opera or sung in a concert performance, like an Italian serenata. But it was the first time Handel had tackled a dramatic text in English. The sacred work was Esther, an oratorio on a much larger scale than Aces. A number of solo singers are joined by a chorus and a substantial orchestral contingent, and Handel clearly relished the chance to write something on this sort of scale. Both Asis and Esther would gather dust for many years before Handel revisited them. From 1720, Handel returned to live in central London and returned to writing and performing operas. He was appointed as one of the staff composers in a new venture known as the Royal Academy of Music, this had no connection with the famous music school, which now bears that name. It was a joint stock company dedicated to providing a sound financial footing for opera performance in the capital. It also had serious support from the king, who gave a thousand pounds a year to the venture. Handel composed many operas for the company, which lasted for eight years. Shortly afterwards, in 1723, Handel rented a house in Mayfair, in Brook Street, which would be his home for the rest of his life. And that house today is a museum uh, to handle. Hasn't been open for that long, funnily enough. You'd think it would have been open for a very long time. Uh, but it is now open. I used to get my hair cut right opposite there, and I used to look across and say, gosh, Handel lived there. And it's right next door to where Jimi Hendrix lived. Rather different sort of composer, but I do believe that Jimi Hendrix was told who his erstwhile neighbour was and was quite impressed. I'm sure the feeling would have been mutual. But yes, Handel made his home in London for all those years, uh, never returned to his native Germany, so I think we can claim him fairly as one of ours. Handel lived in his house for 36 years, and the majority of the site is dedicated to him. It was here, in this elegant but compact home, that Handel composed his last 30 or so operas, and virtually all the English oratorios, concertos, and later orchestral works. Here, he rehearsed his singers and principal instrumentalists before stage rehearsals in the theatre. Here, he even sold tickets to the public. The interior has been restored to what it probably looked like in Handel's day. Visitors can see his small composing room, and can hear intimate performances of Handel's music given by leading musicians in the very rooms he inhabited for half his life. This is the private room where he composed, and here, out of him, poured in unimaginable profusion extraordinarily sublime masterpieces. This is where he composed Messiah, the work with which his name will always be synonymous. Handel composed it in a state of high emotion. <laughs> engaging with the great story with extreme personal passion. We're told he wept and even turned away meals, not a common thing with Handel. He finished it in just 24 days. The most famous opera from this period is Julius Caesar. Its well-crafted text gave him the opportunity to write a work which not only contained dazzling music, but which also had real dramatic power. Julius Caesar premiered in 1724 and ran for 13 performances. It was revived in subsequent years as well. For the 30 years Handel composed operas for London, he did much more than compose. He directed every performance, ran the rehearsals, hired and fired the singers and the orchestra, leased the theatres and even sold tickets from his house. And by all accounts, he was a tough taskmaster with a colourful repertoire of expletives in four languages. While rehearsing Ottone in 1723, his new star soprano Francesca Cuzzoni took exception to one of the arias in her part and refused to sing it. Handel, it is said, picked her up and held her outside the window until she agreed to sing the aria as written, which she did. On another occasion, a tenor was so infuriated with Handel during a rehearsal in the theatre that he threatened to jump off the stage and onto his harpsichord. Handel replied, 
Let me know when you will do that, and I will advertise it. I am sure more people will come to see you jump than to hear you sing. In 1727, George I died. Shortly before his death, he gave royal assent to an act of parliament which formalized Handel's naturalization as a British subject. From this point, Handel anglicized his name and was now officially English. As the most famous composer in London, he was invited to compose the anthems for George II's coronation in Westminster Abbey. The four anthems for George II in 1727 rank among Handel's most spectacular works, and one, Zadok the Priest, has been sung at every British coronation ever since. Not bad for the barber surgeon's son from Halle. Westminster Abbey is one of only two venues still standing in which Handel's music was premiered. The other is the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford, where his oratorio, Athaliah, was heard for the first time in 1733. The 1730s were a remarkable decade for Handel. The Royal Academy was wound up in 1729, but he went on composing and performing operas on a freelance basis, using the Academy's sets and costumes for a few more years. Around 1730, reflecting the changing tastes of the public, he started to develop a more modern style in his operas. Partenope, an opera premiered in 1730, is rather light-hearted, even funny in spots, but his experiments in Italian opera didn't always catch the public imagination public taste was changing. The question was, how would the composer respond? In 1732, on his 47th birthday, Handel went to a performance mounted in a London tavern by Bernard Gates, the master of the children of the Chapel Royal. Somehow Gates had managed to get hold of a copy of Handel's Esther, written for James Bridges nearly 15 years earlier. Gates performed it in a room in the tavern with the boys and men of the choir of the Chapel Royal, with Handel in the audience. What Handel thought of the performance isn't recorded, but he clearly thought the work had potential as a way of reconnecting with his audiences. He had no plans to perform opera in English, but what about slipping an English oratorio into the opera seasons now and again? It was worth a try. Handel revised Esther and greatly expanded it to fill an entire evening in the way his opera audiences expected. He performed it six times in the middle of his Italian opera performances and it went down pretty well. Then coincidentally, his other big piece for Bridges came back to haunt him. Some years before, Handel had published the songs from Asis and Galatea. Now in a theatre right across the road from his, another impresario had cobbled together a version of the Asis story using Handel's songs and filling in the gaps with other music. Handel had to fight back, and so following the successful president of Esther, devised a new oratorio version of Asis and Galatea, which he presented four times later in the year. Handel always worked fast, and 1732 showed he could jump when circumstances required. In just a few months, he had gone from exclusively offering Italian operas to offering a mixed season of Italian operas peppered with English oratorios. He also added organ concertos as entractes in his oratorios, showing off his prowess as one of the leading organists in Europe and providing another unique attraction, which no competitor could match. Over the next eight years, Handel wrote more English oratorios, interspersing them with his Italian operas. The public response was generally very positive, and not only because the oratorios were in English, their religious subjects, most of them drawn from the Bible, chimed with a growing sense of seriousness about personal piety at the time. In addition, and in parallel, he wrote secular English-language odes, and as the decade proceeded, the proportion of English to Italian works grew. So among all the Italian operas, Handel performed Deborah and Athaliah in 1733 and revived them several times in the next couple of years. 
Alexander's feast followed in 1736, then Saul and Israel in Egypt in 1738. The Ode for St. Celia's Day was written in 1739 before the inevitable happened in 1740. Handel finally presented a season which was entirely made up of works in English with no Italian operas at all. He still clung on to the hope that Italian operas could be made popular, though. He premiered his final opera, Dei Damir, in early 1741, but it flopped. Opera had been the focus of his life since he was 18, but now the oratorios had won, and Handel's new career, at the age of 56, had begun. Six months after presenting his last Italian opera, Handel wrote Messiah, his best known and most frequently performed work. It had its first performance in 1742 in Dublin, while Handel was on a concert tour to the Irish capital. Right from the start, it was regarded by the composer as a charity fundraiser. The 1742 premiere raised 400 pounds for Dublin's debtors' prisons, enabling 142 men to be released from prison, their debts paid off. Handel gave two subscription seasons in Dublin, but saved Messiah for later, presenting it as a standalone event. His chorus was made up of members of the choirs of Dublin's two main cathedrals, Christ Church and St. Patrick's, but performed in a new venue, Neil's Music Hall, in Fishamble Street. It could comfortably seat around 600, but the press advertisements showed that the promoters clearly expected many more. The ladies were expressly asked to come without hoops in their skirts, and the men without swords. Just as well, in the event, 700 people crammed in for what proved to be an astonishing popular success for the composer. Neil's no longer exists. All that remains is the entrance archway in the corner of an otherwise unremarkable street. A modern hotel, named after the composer, stands nearby. Dublin cherishes its connection with Handel. Every year, there's an open-air performance of Messiah's Hallelujah Chorus in Fishamble Street to commemorate the premiere, and performances at Christmas in Christ Church Cathedral follow Handel's lead in using Messiah to raise funds for charity. London took some time to warm to Messiah. In Dublin, it had been performed in a concert venue, a newfangled music hall. When Handel performed it in his theatre season in London the following year, it was regarded as scandalous. The work is about Jesus and sets words from the Bible. And there was great consternation that Handel had crossed the line of decency by performing such a piece in a theatre, a place associated in the minds of the pious as being the domain of the ungodly. There were articles in the press opposing the work, and sermons were preached against it. He wisely put it aside for a few years until he had the chance to rehabilitate it in the eyes of the English. There's no doubt about the piece of music, I think, for which Handel is best known, and it's the one that is most often asked for on Classic FM, the radio station that I present on, and that is his great oratorio, Messiah. Um, interestingly, given its premiere in Dublin, not in London, uh, when it was premiered in London, the king very famously stood for the Hallelujah Chorus. So to this day, audiences tend to stand for the Hallelujah Chorus out of respect for the music, as they believe that King George III stood out of respect for the music probably because he'd actually had a very large meal and consumed vast quantities of alcohol, it was more comfortable for him to stand. However, legends are born that way. The Hallelujah Chorus, I mean, who doesn't know the Hallelujah Chorus? Totally joyous, wonderful, wonderful piece of music, and I think, without doubt, the most popular amongst our listeners. Mm -hmm. 
The only time I've personally been involved in performing Handel was as a schoolboy uh, in the school choir. We did ha uh, Messiah every year, uh, and in my first year I sang treble, boy soprano, boy treble, um, and in my final year I sang in the bass uh, section of the choir. So I know Messiah pretty well. It is an extraordinary work, and you know it doesn't matter how often you hear it, it always sounds fresh. The harmonies and the way he fits the words, and remember English was his second language, and yet he fits the words into the music so well. Uh, Messiah by Handel, such a great piece of it. Messiah was followed by Samson, Samele, Joseph and his brethren, Hercules and Belshazzar, all enormously successful. Then came the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, led from Scotland by the doomed figure of Charles Stuart, grandson of the deposed James II. Bonnie Prince Charlie, his supporters called him, and the king over the water. Handel, with his highly developed sensitivity to popular feeling, responded with something new. His next four oratorios, the occasional oratorio, Judas Maccabeus, Joshua and Alexander Baylus, all grew out of the crisis surrounding the rebellion and its bloody repression at the hands of the Duke of Cumberland, known after the Battle of Culloden as Butcher Cumberland. Capitalizing on the fearful public mood, these pieces were hugely popular. Thereafter, Handel had a faithful, loyal audience who flocked to his Lenten seasons to hear new works mixed with the revivals of earlier ones. The late oratorios crown a glorious career with sublime music, as dramatic and as powerful as anything he ever wrote, filled with the deep sense of emotional maturity that can only come with the wisdom of age. Susanna, Solomon, Theodora, the choice of Hercules and Jephthah, all written in his 60s, are overwhelming in every respect, deeply personal, human statements. In 1750, Handel presented Messiah again, this time in the chapel of a new charitable institution in London. The foundling hospital had been the brainchild of a retired sea captain, Thomas Coram, moved by the plight of the many abandoned children on London's streets. Children found on the streets, hence foundling, were taken in, cared for and educated, and Handel was one of the many prominent figures of the time who supported the institution. He eventually accepted an invitation to be on the Board of Governors. So popular was the fundraising Messiah in the Foundling Hospital Chapel in 1750 that it became an annual event, continuing the work's original charitable purpose from the Dublin Premier and establishing the tradition of annual performances which continues to this day around the world. Now called the Thomas Coram Foundation, the institution still operates on the same site in central London, continuing the tradition of supporting children and their families. The chapel no longer exists, but a museum on the site contains many artifacts relating to Handel, housing one of the most important collections of original Handel scores and performance parts. These include his precious performing score and performing parts for Messiah, which he left to the Foundling Hospital in his will, as well as the will itself. The composer is honored in an adjoining street nearby, which is named after him. Handel struggled to complete Jephthah in 1751, when he was 66. His sight had been failing, and work was halted more than once, simply because he couldn't focus on the page. The oratorio seasons continued, with help from others, as after a botched operation on cataracts, he gradually became completely blind and increasingly frail. But they were permanent fixtures in London's musical calendar, and his audiences remained faithful to the end. His final new piece, performed two years before he died, was the triumph of time and truth, a revision of an Italian work from half a century before, 
Its title is an apt summary of his extraordinary life and unparalleled body of work. The end came on Saturday the 14th of April, 1759, the day after Good Friday. He was 74. At Handel's request, he was buried in the south transept of Westminster Abbey, and he provided 600 pounds in his will for an appropriate monument. That area of the Abbey is now known as Poet's Corner, as most of the people buried there are writers. In 1870, Charles Dickens was buried right next to Handel, and both are overlooked by the monument on the wall which Handel himself paid for. As with the statue in Halle, Jenny Lind, the Swedish soprano, is remembered below Handel's monument in Poet's Corner. Two things are remarkable about the life of George Frederick Handel, among many remarkable achievements. One is the incredible transformation he underwent from prospective Lutheran church musician to young firebrand wowing the rich and famous in Italy to a 30-year career as an opera composer in London. And finally, the more or less inventing English oratorio and making a career of that. The other remarkable thing is that he wrote so much wonderful music and yet so little of it is widely known or performed. Messiah is a fine work, but he wrote so much more. 42 operas, nearly 30 odes and oratorios, huge numbers of church works, dozens of secular cantatas, chamber works, sonatas, keyboard pieces, orchestral suites and concertos. The list is staggering. It was a wonderful life, and the musical treasures Handel left us are immeasurable. His good friend James Smith said of him, he was a good Christian with a true sense of his duty to God and man, and in perfect charity with all the world. In 1824, a German composer said, Handel is the greatest composer who ever lived. I would bear my head and kneel at his grave. That composer was Ludwig van Beethoven. His importance to English music was acknowledged with the high tribute of a state funeral attended by over 3,000 mourners. He was buried, needless to say, in Westminster Abbey. Born in Germany, Handel had long been Britain's most celebrated musician. Famously irascible, with an idiosyncratic command of the English language, he had nonetheless entertained kings and the public and set Christ's life to music.